thank you all for joining the webinar today. Um, as we are well aware, our entire industry is feeling the effects of COVID-19. And obviously, as an event organizer in the aviation industry, it's been incredibly frustrating that we've been unable to bring people together in person. Now, as I are to say, aviation is the business of freedom. And in this spirit, as we're kept isolated from each other, I thought this was a great time to create a program of informative webinars where we can share ideas, see each other's faces, inspire one another, and collaborate to ensure that the current crisis is one that we emerge from stronger than ever before, and more resilient than ever. Um, for those of you who don't know me, and I, I recognize a lot of the names on the attendee list that, uh, that came through, my name's John Howell. I'm the CEO and founder of AviaDev Africa. We're an aviation events company dedicated to improving air connectivity to, from, and within the African continent. The 2020 event was due to take place in May, on the 6th of May in Madagascar, but unfortunately, due to the virus, we've had to postpone this to the end of September, the 28th to the 30th of September. Uh, we will still be aiming for those dates, and this will be taking place in Antananarivo in Madagascar, where a new airport terminal will shortly open, which heralds a new dawn for the country. I'm also the host of the only podcast dedicated to African aviation. Many of our panelists have been on the uh, podcast as guests. This is AviaDev Insight Africa. You can find that for free on almost all platforms. So if you've got some downtime, if you're isolating at home, as I am currently sat in Manchester, my, uh, my eBay purchase um, row, of, row of chairs from, uh, from, a, from an Airbus, um, then you can, uh, you can obviously download those and, and gorge on the 115 episodes that we have there. So the first thing to say before we get started is that COVID-19 is, is unprecedented in terms of the impact it's having on people around the globe. And we're aware this virus is very much affecting lives and the health of ourselves and our loved ones. And that is, of course, the most important thing at all times and the most important thing currently. But having said that, of course, the purpose of the webinar is to move this forward, bring some of the industry's leading minds together and discuss some ideas around what the impact of COVID-19 means for African aviation and tourism, and obviously try and come up with some shared ideas as to how to combat this fast moving and ever evolving issue. So before we start, I know that for many of you, this will be the first time you've been part of a Zoom webinar. So I just wanted to run through um, some of the housekeeping rules with you. So the format of the webinar is that we have two guest presenters, which will be Philip and Becca. They're going to provide an overview on the African hotel and aviation markets respectively as a starting point. And then we'll move into a panel discussion with our panelists from the African aviation and tourism media. Now only our panelists will have the ability to use their microphones. This ensures that um, we have clear lines of communication. Now, should you want to pose a question at any time, please quit, click on the Q&A button, uh, which you'll see. You, we'll try and get to those either today or in the coming days or maybe in future webinars. And my plan is to make this a series of weekly webinars bringing different parts of the industry together. Um, we will also pose the questions to Philip and Becca after their respective presentations. So feel free to, to add the, ask those questions as they go through the slides. After the webinar, we'll send you a copy of the recording. We'll upload the full webinar to YouTube as well so it can be shared and watched back whenever you wish. Now, there are two interactive polls that I've set up that are going to appear on your screen to vote on because I know that sitting there and, and just uh, absorbing information isn't always the greatest thing. So let's take, the, um, let's take the first poll. So if you can all vote on your screens now. This is how long do you think the African aviation and tourism industry will take to recover? Hopefully you can all see that. If you can uh, just make your votes, I can see them coming in now. So what I want to do with this, we've got nearly half the people have voted. So if you can quickly do that, we'll see what the results are um, of this and compare. We'll ask this poll again at the end of the session and see how the, how the results have changed. So we're looking here, most of the people are saying Q4 2020 or Q1 2021, which is nice and optimistic. Um, so we like that. Uh, so I'm going to end that poll now. And we're going to move on to the first session, which I'm delighted to say, let me go back to the screen, is um, Philip from STR is going to take us, take us through the hospitality side of um, what's happening in Africa. So uh, I will now Give me one second. I will now give the microphone to Philip, and away we go. So, Philip, over to you. 
Sorry, I think I've just muted you. You go. Okay, we're all good. Thank you, John, and good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, what I wanted to do is really just give you an, uh, an idea of of where we are from a, a hospitality point of view. Um, we're obviously going to look at Africa, but I thought I would start where it all started, really, just to give you an idea of um, how it's progressed over time, not only from uh, from Asia Pac, from China, Asia Pac, through into the Middle East, through into Europe, and uh, a little bit of America as well. So we'll give you an overall, or I will hope, hopefully give you an overall idea of, uh, of where we are. So if we just move on to the next slide, John. So that's kind of what I've just talked about, a global, a global overview, review of Europe, review of the Middle East and Africa. Um, we'll move on a slide. Uh, so the global impact, and then on to the this slide. So uh, what we're looking at here, you've got uh, mainline China. So we had around about 10,000 hotels providing data to us in China. So a very, very good sample. So from the very first of uh, January there, 2020, you can see where the occupancy was running up to sort of 70% for mainline China, mainland China. Although I think uh, coronavirus was first talked about very end of December, it started to take hold a little bit around about the second to third week of January. And we can see the devastating impact on China where occupancies drop from sort of a seasonal average of around about 70% down to 10, 9, 8%. Uh, Beijing, Shanghai at that point, and I still think very, very similar, around about 6 or 7% occupancy. So a very, very tough time for China. If we just move on a little bit, there we go. It's 89% decrease. It happened very, very quickly. Now on the far right, uh, sorry, I just go back one, John, green shoots. We are starting to see a little bit of a change. Now, green shoots may be a little bit of a wishful thinking in a way, but we are beginning to see some improvements in China. Now that's very, very important because as China improves, that hopefully will start to come all across the, uh, all across the globe. So we're hoping that will continue. On to the next one. Yep. Okay, uh, I just wanted to, to have a look. I mean, we know about Italy, um, we know about China, the US now, which was really, I think Af with Africa aside, I think the US was the last to be affected, but we can see how quickly China and Italy dropped from these uh, traditional occupancies and we can see how the US is beginning to change week by week. We probably will see that drop quite considerably um, over the next two to three weeks. Um, and where it actually ends remains to be seen. Again, you can see China starting to come up a little bit. So that is encouraging news. We go on to the next one. Nowhere has not been impacted. What we're looking at here is occupancy change. So it's a year on year change for week of the 2nd of March. And this has been the biggest hit for um, since the coronavirus uh, came about. So pretty big occupancy changes, 70% uh, China, Italy, South Korea, we know where they are, uh, and then a little less so on the far right-hand side. But these are significant. They will get worse, I'm afraid, before they get better, certainly in some countries. Um, so we are in a little bit of a hole. So we're going to the next one. Here we're looking at SARS. Uh, we're looking at Beijing, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Guadang, and Chengdu. So I didn't pronounce those too well. But what we try to do here is look at when the SARS kind of impact, which was 2003, the impact of SARS on these Chinese cities and when it came back. And really effectively from when it started, March 2003, you see the arrow on the top. It took a good six months to return to similar hotel performances as from six months prior. Now, the drops, we can argue with coronavirus, are a little bit harder, um, but it is encouraging. Once we make progress with 
uh, this situation. We hope to see markets coming back, whether it's six months, whether it's eight months remains to be seen, but that gives us some hope that things will come back to normal when we get hold of this problem. Further afield, I think next one, John, further afield. Um, some of these cities were less impacted. Now, at the moment, they have been more impacted. So we do expect this to be a slightly longer period than six months before they return. Um, exactly how long remains to be seen, but we are hopeful. Uh, on to the next one, John. Just giving you an idea of some of the European cities, I'm sure we've seen a lot of the European news. Um, it seems to have taken Europe by storm. On the far side, you can see uh, week on week how the uh, occupancy has changed. So we've gone from, I think, the 3rd of February through to the 2nd of March. And we obviously can see um, significant drops as we get through the weeks. And they will continue i'm afraid for some time so quite significant changes uh, here we're looking at the pickup we also um, collect data for business on the books i think is probably the best way to look at it generally speaking we see pickup of 12 to 14 percent within the week here we see all those lines below the zero percent so what we are seeing is cancellations and that's the reality of the situation all across these european cities we're seeing cancellations at the moment and no real pickup to talk about on to the next one uh, looking at some of the Middle East Africa countries, uh, we've got Morocco and Egypt in there. Now, Africa, we will see shortly, was or has been uh, affected a little later than most of the other regions. Uh, Morocco and Egypt, very much leisure-driven uh, markets. We're beginning to see some of the issues. Um, I think both Morocco and Egypt were, you know, they got away with it for two or three weeks, but now Morocco is down 18% year on year for that week. Egypt, 20%. The UAE, where I'm based, is having a pretty tough time, particularly in Dubai, 25% down. Kenya, uh, I think a market with uh, a lot of events and corporate business, 29% down for the last week. And Saudi Arabia is, uh, is going to be a big issue, particularly with religious tourism for the time being. On to the next one. So when we look more specifically at Africa, um, this is really up to 2019. I mean, the good news there is we're looking at supply and demand changes. Demand is simply room sold. So more people coming into Africa in 2017 and 2018. So strong demand numbers coming into Africa. In 2019, demand was uh, exceeded supply. So again, good demand growth. And we can see the RevPAR line, so revenue per available room. Um, and it is has been growing for some time. So that's that was the picture at the end of 2019. Some stellar years for Africa, for sure. And some of these cities doing very, very well. As we move forward to uh, the end of February 2019, we can see things are beginning to change. Um, less affected, probably, Jan, Feb. We'll have a look at March in a minute. But you can see the northern um, cities... Uh, of Casablanca, Algiers, Tunisia, they are starting to get hit. Sharm el Sheikh down 37%. And this is revenue per available room. So a, a, a metric of a combination of occupancy and uh, average room rate. So 37% down in Sharm el Sheikh. Cairo has not been uh, unaffected, 9% down. Moving down to Sub Saharan, I think Addis had a very good couple of, couple of months with some big events. Lagos, uh, even through March, I think a, a big uh, oil conference in March has um, helped Lagos for this uh, first uh, 10 weeks. But generally speaking, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, down in Cape Town, again, Jan Feb was reasonably good, but we are beginning to see some changes. The Seychelles uh, and Mauritius, January, February, we, we have seen some uh, occupancy drops, but average room rate has been pushed up a little bit. So it's the occupancy that has dropped the revenue per available room in those two cities. 
So a little bit of a mixed bag. If we move on to the next, the next slide, this will give a more of an indication of how uh, these countries have changed over the last five weeks. So the first bar is third of third uh, of February. Then we have the 10th, 17th, all the way through to the 9th of March. So we are very, very up to date here. And we can quite easily see what's happened. Through the first sort of two, three, four weeks of uh, February, there was no real reaction to coronavirus whatsoever. It really started to hit the last week of February where we started to see some changes. Seychelles and Ghana, no reaction actually there. Um, we saw Tanzania. Kenya, a little bit of a drop, uh, Morocco and Tunisia in that fourth week, and then all of them started to accelerate. So we now get to the week of, uh, or week of the 9th of March and we can see some significant drops. If we look on the left-hand side, you can see how big those drops are. So Kenya, in terms of occupancy change for this week last year, over 40%. But your average across these uh, African countries ran about 40%. Less affected at the moment, the Seychelles. So we will keep an eye on that. So it's certainly caught up um, in Africa, uh, that is for sure. Uh, again, looking at occupancy change, week of the 9th of March, uh, the biggest drop is Cairo, uh, followed by Tunisia. But all these, uh, all these cities are badly affected. Cape Town a little bit less. Uh, we will keep an eye on Cape Town and some of the markets down in South Africa. Uh, currently for this week, 18% down year on year. But I'm afraid, like all the European cities, like the Middle Eastern cities, and obviously in Asia Pac, we are beginning to see a very, very similar trend. We'll go on to the next one there, John. This looks a little bit of a, a messy slide, but we're looking at occupancy change from the 17th of, uh, of February, and we picked out some of the key cities in Africa. And we could see year on year, they were very much um, compared to, comparing well to 2019, but the last two or three weeks, we're beginning to see that downward trajectory, downward momentum, uh, as we look towards the right-hand side. So. All markets are below where they were last year. And obviously the big question is, at what point or how low do they go? Uh, I think the lowest one there is Tunisia, which is kind of an 80% drop, a very leisure driven market. Number two is Cairo. So that's been hit pretty badly as well, followed by Casablanca. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Some are holding on a little bit better than others. Um, but I'm afraid there are going to be some further drops uh, in Africa. Going to the next one, um, average daily rate. I think this is quite interesting because although there are drops in Africa, they're not as pronounced as some of the other uh, markets or cities around the world. We see more of a reaction in terms of dropping rates, dropping selling prices. But in Africa, generally speaking, I know they are down, but they are not dropping as quickly, which would be reasonably sensible. I mean, it's not, not, for me to, not for me to say, but I think it's quite interesting the way the African cities are trying to sort of hold on to rate, not necessarily thinking they can drive demand by, by dropping rates. So it's quite an interesting slide. Uh, we're just going to look at a few uh, individual cities now. Um, from the 1st of January, we can see an occupancy change year on year. So we see the 1st through to the 10th was strong in Cape Town. And then it was a little bit up and down through the midsection. But we can see on the far right hand side that occupancies are beginning to drop. And the biggest day, no coincidence, is the 11th of March. So unfortunately, we probably will see that trend continuing for for a little bit of time uh, if we go to Cairo uh, Cairo I mean has had a very very tough time as we know over the last few years but was bouncing back quite nicely nothing major first through to the 26th but we can see the last week or 10 days there has been some considerable drops 
And now Cairo, year on year from an occupancy point of view, is 60, 65, 70% down. So a big struggle, struggling Cairo at the moment. Moving on to Nairobi, I was a little bit surprised. Nairobi seemed to be impacted very, very quickly. It could be um, events which were which were cancelled or postponed, but uh, we've seen significant drops in uh, in Nairobi of fifty percent. So again, a very, very tough time for for Kenya for for Nairobi. And we go to the next one, Lagos. Well, I mentioned earlier on that there was a big event. Uh, I think it was SAPEC, maybe SAPEC, which happened uh, sort of mid to late April. Uh, this is quite unusual to see this trend where Lagos actually grew occupancy very, very well, up to 140% increase around about the 15th, 16th of, uh, of February. So it had a good run. Uh, it started to drop later than all other African cities, but we can see now at the far right hand side, there are drops happening. Um, in relation to the whole uh, slide, it doesn't look too much, but it is sort of 25 to 30% down. So again, uh, Lagos is also, has also been affected by, by the virus. And I think we have one more. So Mauritius, um, yes, obviously uh, a leisure-driven uh, market. I think when you have a look at the 22nd through the 29th, you could probably argue that Chinese New Year gave it a little bit of a bolster there, where occupancy was up year on year. But very soon after Chinese New Year, we begin to see the declines in occupancy. Uh, at the moment, we're down to about 35 40%. So it's a tough one. Um, we've got to remain positive. Hopefully, when we looked at the, the, the data coming out of China, we're beginning to see some green roots. I fear it's a little bit early at the moment, but we will keep an eye on it. Um, and yeah, that, that is where we stand at the moment. So I'm sorry we cannot provide any better news, but um, we've got to hope that things improve quickly. So there you go. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank, thank you, Philip. Um, just quickly, I do have, uh, you've been checking the questions. So we do have one from um, Jonathan Worsley, our chairman. And he's just asked, have you extrapolated the global impact of this decline, uh, the red par decline on total revenue loss for the industry on a weekly or monthly basis? So maybe something you can respond to. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I was hoping to get this done by today, but we've just completed processing. This sounds convenient, Jonathan, I'm sure. We have just completed processing, so we have an awful lot of data to, um, to go through to get those numbers, but we will be providing those numbers fairly shortly. But it is, it is significant, obviously. Oh, fantastic. And I know, um, uh, obviously, we're on the conclusion side. Have you, have you covered that, Philip? Well, um, conclusions are that we uh, we just need to keep an eye on it. It's very, very diff. It's very, very difficult and very, very different in many, many different cities. But um, we need to do whatever we can do to, you know, to contain. Um, I think in the hotel industry, it's remarkably diff difficult. We're seeing hotels being. Um, we're seeing hotel closures. We're seeing floor closures. We're even seeing hotels being pushed to for for government requirements. So um, we just need we just need to hope that this they they get hold of this sooner than later, though, so we can start getting back to to normal times. So, okay, um, fantastic. Yeah. And I think you know it just sets the scene sets the scene nicely. If anybody does want to ask any more questions, do it through the Q and A um, if you can, as opposed to uh, on the uh, sort of raising your hand because we, we've obviously got panelists and we've got more things to get to. So, um, okay, I will. Uh, uh, Noel has just asked a question actually from Askai, the commercial director of Askai in Togo. He's just said, for an airline, what's the best way to go about extracting the right data to be able to project an accurate impact at the end? I would guess, Phil, that would be to get a deal with STR. <laughs> the, the airline data? No, I think he, he's talking about the, the from obviously when he's looking at um, route planning and network planning which would be his role i think this is right Noel. uh then obviously it's everything that goes into the mix not just the the, the sort of um 
the, the demand itself, but also obviously what's happening to the to the uh, the hotel side as well, and the demand and the supply and uh, and the red par and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, when when you know we 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 collect data for you know close to eighty thousand hotels worldwide, and we operate in pretty much every market. So you know, we will start to see the green shoots when they start to come through. We do do a lot of webinars at the moment and we are very, very happy to share this information. So we want to support, you know, all industries with this data and as we will be monitoring it as we do on a daily basis. And as soon as we start to see things improving, we will share that information. So that should be helpful. Fantastic. Okay, so we're now going to move on and we're going to get into the um, airline side of things. Uh, and Becca Rowland from Midas Aviation um, and Aviadev Consul is going to give us a little bit of an overview in terms of um, where, we, where we go next, where we stand at the, at, at the moment, I should say, really. Um, so, Becca, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I think I have. Can you hear there me? There you go. We can indeed. Great. Okay, let me just turn the questions off here. Thanks very much. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go through, in some ways, not dissimilar material to Phil. I've got a few fewer slides, but um, looking at it from an aviation perspective, and some of the messages are, are quite similar, obviously. If you could go to the first slide. Um, so this is a chart I borrowed from somewhere else um, over the week, over the last couple of days, just showing how this virus has spread, obviously starting in China and then moving across into Europe and, and so on. So um, I, I know, John, you didn't, you didn't speak about the numbers, but 180,000 reported cases worldwide um, and 7,500 um, deaths now. So more cases outside China than in China. In Africa, the latest data from WHO, they do a, a situation report every day. I don't know if anybody's looking at it, but it gives you the numbers with quite detailed breakdowns by country. Um, so they are currently reporting 228 cases across the whole of Africa, um, though that actually doesn't include North Africa. Their definition of Africa is pretty much sub-Saharan Africa and only around four deaths. So, I think the message, one of the messages I'll be saying is pretty much like Phil, that actually this is a progression we're seeing across from one part of the world across to other parts. And so we need to understand the trends elsewhere to be able to see what's coming in places like Africa. So that's, that's how you need to look at the data that I've, I show you from other markets. This is a sense of what's, what's, what's coming. Um, in some ways, you know, what I, I've, I've, talked with John extensively in the past about you know the, the issues of connectivity in Africa in some ways um, th the problems of connectivity have meant that we've seen this lower rate of infection in Africa um, so you know ironically perhaps that's that's given Africa more time to deal with this more time for uh, the impact to, to take hold I've got some slides now a little bit like Phil's but showing the impact on global aviation so this is flights and what you're seeing here is the gray line is um, flights last year with the, and then the yellow line, the comparable number this year. So at the moment, we're running at 12% globally in, term, in, in the schedule, less than it was a year ago. Um, the impact, um, if you move on to the next slide. So we've got six countries here. Um, if anybody's interested, I can provide more. These come from OEG and I'm updating this data every Monday morning for OEG at the moment and it's available on their website. Um, so China, you can see the, the traffic, the flights, the capacity fell very sharply uh, through, through February. But as Phil said, with hotel occupancy, it's been picking up. Um, what we saw at the beginning was very much the, the drop in capacity was demand led. People were choosing not to fly and airlines were responding by pulling capacity because their planes were, were less, less full. And, and so they didn't want to incur uh, the operating costs if they didn't have the revenue coming in. What we're seeing now is we've moved to much more of a supply side issue where airlines are being told they can't fly or countries are putting restrictions on, in place. And I'll come on to that in a little bit. So we see a sort of progression here. You see China first with a really big hit and slight recovery, South Korea, um, 
the, the traf uh, the capacity's fallen by, uh, I think it's about 56%. Hong Kong's decimated. I mean, they were struggling anyway. You can see at the beginning of the year, capacity was below what was a year ago. It's now about 80%, just over 80% below where it was. What we've seen in Europe, Italy uh, first, uh, absolutely nosedive. The same sort of period that we see with Phil's data, uh, just within the last two weeks, the capacity has just fallen off a cliff. Um, the UK is slightly behind that, and then when we get to places like Qatar, a little bit behind that again. I want to move on to the next one, John. So I've pulled out four key African markets here. Uh, South Africa, we're not seeing um, a huge drop in capacity at the moment in South Africa. Um, it's been running below where it was all year, but that's issues with South African airlines. We're not seeing any particular impact from coronavirus now on the, on the capacity. Nigeria, the capacity has been running ahead of where it was a year ago. Um, that's partly due to air peace and aero contractors doing quite well. Again, we're not seeing yet any drop off in capacity by the airlines. You look at Kenya, again, it's tracking last year, it's below the level of capacity we had a year ago, uh, but we're not seeing really a, a change in airline capacity in response to what's happening now. And I've put Madagascar in there because obviously uh, we, we should have been all going to Madagascar um, in the beginning of uh, May. And again, we're not really seeing an impact. So while, while this in some ways feels good, we're not seeing uh, uh, an impact on capacity, what it means is that airlines are flying their planes and incurring those operating costs at the moment, and almost certainly the planes are, are far emptier than they would have been. So they're not getting the revenue. So that doesn't bode well for the airlines in terms of their, uh, their, their balance sheets and their, their, um, their business. And we will see airlines fail as a result of this um, all over the world, um, because it's just, it's not sustainable to not have that revenue for a period of time. Do you want to go to the next slide? So this is, this is my last slide. And what I've, I've done here is just summarize some of the actions that we're seeing being taken. So as I said earlier, this is now a more supply-led situation when it comes to aviation. And there's a number of different actions that are happening in the marketplace, uh, which uh, the airlines are having to respond to. So uh, countries banning travelers from some places, that's what's happening as an example with Angola. They're not permitting passengers from certain countries. Uh, there are countries that are only permitting residents to enter, uh, so Kenya is doing that, only allowing citizens and foreigners with a valid residence to, to come in. So obviously that means the planes um, are, are much less full because those other people who would be travelling can't, can't, can't enter can, Kenya. Uh, there's countries quarantining passengers from certain places, uh, that's what Burundi is doing. Um, so again, that's putting people off travelling. Um, obviously, if you think you're going to go somewhere and be quarantined for 14 days, you're probably not going to travel in the first place. There are airlines that are suspending operations to some countries. We know Ethiopian, just as an example, have suspended operations to Bahrain uh, for a period of time. Uh, there's airlines suspending flights to their own country. So Chad, as a country, has suspended all uh, passenger flights into the country for 14 days. And then we've just got airport closures. So somewhere like Djibouti has just closed the airport. So all of those different sorts of actions mean that tourists certainly won't be traveling, uh, they won't be going into those countries. Um, where I see, I think the, the, the comparison with SARS is quite interesting, and I think we should be looking to those sorts of um, events in the past for a pattern of where we move forward, as opposed to looking at something like 9-11, where at the end of the event, there wasn't a sense of when the event has ended, of uh, whether the fear, whether the, um, the caution about traveling, you know, whether it was, it was okay to travel or wasn't. But I think with SARS, and we'll see it with this, there was a sense that this event is now done and we can go back to traveling. So I would be hopeful that once we're through this, traffic is gonna pick up, capacity will pick up. But at the moment, the airlines are going to be in for a very, very turbulent time. Thank you, Becca. That's uh, obviously sobering information. Um, I've had a couple of, uh, we've had a couple of questions, a couple of comments come in. So uh, Tess down there in uh, 
in South Africa has said that SAA has cancelled 124 domestic and regional flights today. So obviously we'll see that coming through on your statistics over yeah. the coming yeah. days. Um, Becca, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of questions that I don't necessarily think we can we can answer or, or you know, maybe 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 I'm uh, an interesting talking point, you know, in terms of um, a, a good one here is uh, from Chloe, uh, Regional Gateway. She said, what's the messaging support from African governments in terms of supporting their airlines and airports if faced with closure? Um, I mean, this is a question. Are we seeing some support packages um, coming into into uh, into the local locality in Africa to say, look, we're we're here to support you. Obviously, we have a lot of national airlines in Africa as well, so this could be an interesting talking point for the the next discussion. And that's what I'd like to do now is just to move into the into the discussion element. Um, now, I, we've managed to get a really great panel together that covers a lot of Africa, and I wanted to open the floor to them now. I wanted to start with Kojo. Kojo is based in um, Accra, Ghana. Uh, he is the editor of Voyage Afrique, uh, a great magazine, a great periodical that covers aviation and tourism around Africa. And I wanted to really go around the panelists and get their input and their um, feelings about how this is impacting on the ground in their respective country. So Kojo, you also, I believe, can give us some information from UNWTO and you can explain to the audience your uh, your role with UNWTO. So if you want to, un I can unmute you and away you go. Okay. All right, John, thank you and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And yeah, uh, thank you, John, for giving us the platform. And can you hear me? Okay. So uh, I think that from, our, from my point of view and from the ground, already Ted... Uh, as the graph indicated, it, it's actually exactly what is on the ground, even not more, because I spoke to hotel chains, you know, private ones, uh, multinationals and all of that. And the, since the first week of March, they, they started rec receiving cancellations, you know, from, uh, from their clients. And, you know, Africa was beginning to take a hit. So governments were putting in measures to ensure that, you know, they don't necessarily go the Italian way, or if you like to say, to, to be able to reduce the impact. So when I spoke to hotels, which most of them, and it will be interesting to know that for Ghana specifically, uh, they depend 75 to 80% of the hotel industry is by uh, you know, uh, international tourism. So they were re really hit to the extent that I spoke to a big hotel who was telling me that they're already looking at cancelling about um, receiving cancellation to the, the team of one to three million euros. Okay, so uh, it was it was it, it was hitting hard. But the point is that if you look across the continent, where we've had issues of uh, intra-African travels, okay, you realize that, like Becca said, because at some point you couldn't say, that, okay, we're not traveling among themselves, among ourselves, or there was no flight connectivity to the region, you had a bit of a less impact in terms of the spread. But on the other way around, you realize that what is happening now then means that um, if we are having over reliance of our industry on the, you know, the international tourism, then it, it, it's all right that we're gonna have the hit. So on the ground, people are really feeling it. From, from Ghana, I, I mean, I was in South Africa two weeks ago, and I've spoken to a lot of the regional heads of hotels and it's really economic depression. And I, I think that it will, it, will, it will take a lot of time. You know, remember that events are being canceled and uh, yeah, we will come back very strong, but also we have to be realistic that once people, countries are beginning to go into a lockdown mode, we will expect that you still have to be able to ensure that you may, you may not have the budget, but recovery plans is what people have to be able to put, uh, put in place. So these are my, you know, Preliminary comment, but from the UNWTO perspective, I, I, I do communication for UNWTO in Africa, and what, we, what we've been saying or what the leadership of Zurab, Pulo Likashvili have been doing was to have a lot of engagement with WHO and to see at what point in time that we can be able to go with, uh, you know, decisions. So there have been a lot of engagement to see that now we know that we are having public health issues. And it's important that we put people first. So from the UNWTO 
point of view, they've been able to come out and supported WHO and our members to say that, yeah, this is where we are going and this is where the world is suffering from. So now we should be able to stay home, of course, travel tomorrow. But then again, you know, you and the is having to understand the times that we are in now. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen the, uh, the the campaign "Stay Home, Travel Tomorrow." I think that's quite a nice message, and uh, obviously, it's it's very unnatural for us all. But thank you for that, KJ. Really, really appreciate it. Now, one of the statistics that Becca brought up in her presentation was Lagos, and Lagos, obviously, in terms of um, capacity and the amount of frequencies, is is not necessarily so, so outperforming last year. So, I'd like to to go to Lagos now and and invite. Um, uh, my colleague Tony to um, give us a, a bit of an overview as how things are going there. You know, is it is it is it is it is it chaos and pandemonium, or are people going about business as usual? Tony, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, everyone? Yep. Tony, no, we'll come back to you, Tony, because I think your connection's not great. Okay, so why don't we, we'll come back to that. Uh, let's go down. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not great, Tony, I'm afraid. We'll come back to you. Um, let's go down south. So let's go to Zimbabwe. Let's go and talk to Nunarai, who's down there in Harare. Um, so what about, what about from your side, Nunarai? What's, what's the, uh, what's the situation and what are people doing about it? Which is also quite an important thing to, to ask. Yes. Um, good afternoon, John. Uh, good afternoon, my fellow panelists and all those who are tuned in listening. Um, not good times around here. Yeah? Uh, the COVID-19 has devastated the world as we are all experiencing right now. But moving closer to home, um, we have seen in, um, in Zimbabwe, for, for an example, where I am from, um, yesterday the president of, um, of Zimbabwe uh, announced some measures uh, that are aimed at reducing the impact of the spread of the COVID virus, like uh, suspending all major events that were lined up, such as the Zimbabwe International Trade Fair, which is a very big regional trade um, investment event. So what that means is we have already lost some uh, traffic that will be coming through to the country for the mice business, and they won't be coming through, which also means that the airlines, they get to have less seats around. Um, airlines also, they've... Um, they've introduced some uh, innovative ways of trying to, to weather the storm. Uh, for, for an example, we have seen the cancellation policy, the route booking policy being extended to two or three uh, bookings at no cost. So this is aimed at uh, retaining the passengers. This is aimed at making sure that people get to, get to, to fly as it will. Then also, um, we have seen a change of culture. Airlines providing sanitary uh, requirements such as sanitizers, wet wipes. When, whenever passengers are boarding, they are, they are not being given wet wipes. It's a practice that we have been seeing only in the business class for most airlines, but we are now seeing it across all the particular airlines. Then um, moving a bit down south, where I'm currently based right now in Johannesburg, Last night, we, it was announced that SA Express, they've succumbed to, to the reduced in demand for the COVID and also other challenges that they had been facing. So they've suspended operations with immediate effect from today and they're on the fly and uh, they will reaccommodate passengers on other flights and for the staff, they've been sent on forced leave, which is not good for for employment and so on. So yeah, this is what is happening down here. Um, most countries in the Sata region, they have um, they are now quarantining passengers 
who are coming from countries that are heavily affected with the coronavirus. You're looking at China, Italy, the, the UK, the, the UK, the US. So whenever passengers come, come in from those particular uh, countries, they are, they are going to be quarantined for, for a period of, of 14 days or provide a valid medical certificate that proves that um, they don't have any symptoms of the coronavirus. Uh, then a bit of a stat, um, earlier on it was mentioned that hotel occupancy around the, around the world, they have dropped drastically. In Victoria Falls, from January to Feb, we recorded a 13% reduction. So this is expected to be, to grow uh, on the negative from February to March because of the COVID virus. So it's not looking good, but like what coach has said, uh, stay now, uh, fly tomorrow. We have to come, to come together like what we are doing on this platform and come up with means and ways of trying to address these means and ways of us to survive this particular um, pandemic that we find ourselves into. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nunarai. Thank you very much. I think the cancellation policy, we've seen that from quite a lot of airlines to extend the cancellation policy. Book today. Don't worry, you can re rechange your flights. I saw Airlink were doing that as well. Um, Fast Jet, obviously, as you mentioned, are doing it too um, down in, in Africa. And I'm not sure whether anybody else has got any, any ideas on how that can work. But what I want to do is I, I want to um, get over to Douala in Cameroon now. So for those of you who don't know, Rom Yul, he's an air traffic controller, but he's also the editor of newsaero.info, which is the francophone aviation website focused on African aviation. So um, Rom Yul, you're kind of our airline guy, uh, not that the other guys aren't, but you're very much focused on that. So if you can give us a bit of an update from your part of the world and, and what you're seeing, that would be great. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm happy to join all of you here. Okay, here in Cameroon, uh, basically we have taken uh, the similar decisions, which has been taken in many other African uh, countries. Uh, the air, air, ground and sea borders uh, have been uh, shutting down since uh, yesterday. And uh, oh, we had, yesterday we had two specific international airliners coming from France, another one from, uh, uh, from, um, uh, from Belgium. What the government have uh, have done? Uh, what the government has done? Uh, all the passengers have been put in quarantine, and some uh, host, uh, hostel around the city have been uh, requisitioned uh, for this specific uh, purpose. But uh, looking on the global view, uh, I can say that our local career, uh, which is not really good in terms of financial uh, financial uh, status. Uh, was not operating out of the country. Uh, the only line out of the country uh, was the one linking with Gabon. But actually, the airline continued to operate on the domestic, uh, domestic market. And uh, when I want to look out to the uh, regional, to the regional uh, environment in Gabon, they have taken the same, uh, the same decisions. And in their country, it's not a radical lockdown. What they have done is only to reduce uh, international flight. So today they, they are low airline to operate only one flight per week, uh, one flight uh, per week. Uh, actually, up to today, even uh, Guinea Equatorial has not yet taken a radical decision by closing their border. Here in Central Africa, actually, it's only Cameroon and Chad who has taken uh, those drastic measures uh, by closing uh, all the all the border, it's true that uh, aviation will be impacted, and uh, the regional market will, will be impacted as well. Uh, that's why I can say uh, from now. Thank you very much, Romuald. So I, I want to go back to Tony, and then we'll come to Lizzie. But I want to go back to Tony. Give you another go, Tony. See whether we can uh, we can hear from you. Lagos, um, just like um, John said, it's not all gloom and doom. Um, 
uh, I must let you all know, in case if you don't know, that uh, the World, World Health Organization has actually commended Nigeria on their efforts in trying to contain this virus. Um, uh, and the CDC here at the Ministry of Health have been doing a great, great job. What we have found out in the past couple of days is that we see people from Europe transiting through Nigeria uh, to the US. Uh, so we find uh, bookings on a particular airline that flies direct to, to US. And they have to check it because they can't fly from UK to US. And since Nigeria has not placed bans on, on countries, uh, they decide to use you know, Nigeria's practice. But just this morning, uh, Nigeria decided to place ban on, on, uh, on and about 11 countries uh, um, with, where have, they have the cases of uh, COVID-19. So uh, to the, this very moment, I start from the case uh, from UK uh, that came in on the 13th of March. It has been considerably affected. We're not having more cases. Um, so people are being quarantined. Um, so now there's a ban. So that will also help the airports, which basically people have been coming in through Lagos, uh, which is the main port of entry where um, the cases are coming in from. Uh, the index case with the Italian has been uh, in treatment and uh, responding to treatment. Um, so at the moment, uh, Lagos is, uh, Nigeria is really calm. They are in control of the whole situation. And um, at the moment, uh, um, I'm actually uh, uh, on location in one of the big hotels in Lagos to just see how things are. Uh, it's, it's a little bit quiet, but I think it's a bit normal. Fantastic. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's interesting how it's affecting different people. And there's some comments and questions, and we'll come to those um, shortly. But a lot of things about the governments in Africa are actually, they've responded a lot quicker because obviously Africa is feeling this after Asia, after Europe, but they've actually responded quicker with more drastic measures. And partly potentially that's because of the availability of the medical care. And, and again, we know all about this sort of um, social isolation and the benefits that can have. I'm sure we've all watched the news and I'm, I'm far from an expert, but I, I understand what that means is stay away from each other and you, you slow the spread of the disease. Um, so, uh, you know, it's very interesting to, to, to see that the numbers obviously, as we as Becca showed, the numbers of, of flights in, in, in Nigeria haven't really changed. So I wanted to go back to Accra again. Um, Lizzie Zazu is, is based there in, in Accra. She's the chief executive officer at GH Aviation, which is a, a media house, training house, specializing in all things aviation. So um, I wanted to come to you first uh, before we move into the questions, Lizzie. So let me just unmute you and uh, we can hear from you. Yeah, hi, John. Hello, everyone. So I'm speaking from Accra. And <clears throat> basically, everyone has said it all because the African government has taken it upon themselves to restrict flights from certain areas. For instance, this morning, a flight uh, from IAD, that's Washington, on South African Airlines. When they got to Accra, um, a lot of them were refused boarding because there, there was a suspected COVID-19 on board. But it really left Accra on time anyways. So um, since COVID-19 came to Ghana, our airports are empty. Our hotels are empty as well. In terms of aviation and tourism, we've seen a decline. the COVID-19 has really, really affected our sector. And uh, with regards to even reportage, we are not able to go out. For instance, um, we, we, need, we had a meeting with the Minister of Aviation, that was three days ago, and we needed to go and capture something. But because there was a ban placed on us by our government, not to get a lot of people together at one place, we couldn't go. So all in all, it's affecting even the media because we'll not be able to go to places where we need to capture events. Yeah, That's absolutely. what is happening in Ghana, yeah. No, no, I understand. And I think that there's two things here which Nuna I touched on and you've touched on as well, which is um, people are afraid to travel because if they travel, they could get stuck uh, somewhere. They'd be told to quarantine in a foreign country, which they don't, for however long, they, they don't know how long. So, of course, people are very un, uh, unwilling to do that. And also 
the communications from say UNWTO from the is stay at home today so we can travel tomorrow. So you're actually the World Tourism Organization is saying, please don't be a tourist at the moment. So obviously it's going to have this huge impact and we've seen the numbers from Becca and from, from Philip as well. So one of the questions um, that I posed a little bit earlier that, that's come through that I really wanted to, to see what was going on because we've got the people on the ground is, is there any messaging coming from any of the governments in your countries about what they're going to do to support airlines or airports through this tough time? Would anybody on the panel like to like to take that one? Lizzie, okay. Okay, um, at the moment, I know that um, with regards to cancellation of flights, um, the airlines have been advised that this is a false majeure. So in case someone cancels their flights, the airlines are not supposed to apply penalties on their flights. And then um, with Ghana, we had a consumer protection act where you, uh, the airline had to pay passengers some money if they cancel their flights or if they delay their flights. But all of them have been put on hold because, because it's, if it's a force majeure, then the airline cannot be held liable to pay any penalties to passengers and all. So I think um, the government of Ghana, Ghana Civil Aviation, Ministry of Aviation, that's what they've taken, the step they've taken just to help the airline to recoup some of the monies. Right, fantastic. No, that, that that's great. Now, um, we have a we have somebody that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have the um, uh, commercial director of Asky Airlines in um, Togo. So I'd like to invite Noel to to say a few words because he's been putting a couple of questions out and just to see how things are from an airline perspective um, sitting there on on the ground in in Togo. So um, Noel, hopefully you can hear us. Noel, can you hear us? Okay, maybe not. Um, is there anything from any of the other panelists in terms of uh, from their countries? Uh, so Tony wants to say something. Yeah, go for it. So yeah, so back here in Nigeria, the aviation community has been putting some kind of pressure, if you will, on government to kind of relax charges, have make airlines augment their losses. But the Central Bank of Nigeria has come forward to put measures in place and not directly to the airline, but they're looking at businesses that have been impacted and they've created a 50 billion naira access to cushion the effect that SMEs have in this period. So you might not say it's direct to the airlines or the airports, but it's just across board to kind of augment the sufferings that people are going to get not, not directly from the government that addresses the airlines or the airport at the moment, but the aviation professionals in Nigeria at the moment are pushing for you know relaxed taxes, charges, and what I be along the value chain to kind of ease the the the, the pains of our aviation stakeholders. Because it's not just airlines, it's also the the aviation security and everybody on the ground and last it is the value chain. Uh, so it's not just we focusing on the airlines, the other value chain that is gonna affect directly or indirectly. So we are pushing for government to kind of look in that direction and see how they can help you know augment those uh yeah, great. And um, uh, we've got uh, Nunarai as well with his other hat on. Obviously, you're working with the civil aviation in Zimbabwe as well. So what kind of support is being offered to the airlines down there and what kind of support is being offered to the airports, I suppose? Okay, uh, thank you, John. Um, not, unfortunately, nothing is yet. Uh, we haven't seen or heard of any um, government support, both on the Zimbabwean and South African side that the governments are putting in place to support airlines at this particular time. So, like I said earlier on, we, we actually witnessed SA Express um, shutting doors yesterday um, because of various issues, but also compounded by the reduced in, in demand um, as a result of this COVID-19. It would be great for, for governments to chip in, um, contribute something, put, um, some stimulus package in in place to help airlines survive at this present moment. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, people need to move fast on this because we know how expensive it is to uh, to to run a um, run an airline to keep it going and to keep the uh, keep keep the energy uh, and the, the 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 finances going. So, um, yeah, I wanted to take a couple more questions before before we finish. Um, 
So quite an interesting one here from my friend Philip, uh, Philip Wakomba. He said, uh, COVID-19 has come at a time where protectionism is still a huge challenge. I mean, this is something that underpins everything that we do at Avia Dev is we want open skies. We want free and fair competition because we want a market that, that, that obviously will thrive in, in the right way. But we understand that there are national carriers and they have their role to play. So what he's asking is it'd be interesting to see how African countries would handle cargo flights. Um, by opening up the skies and exempting these flight operations from travel restrictions? And is there more collaboration? Will this issue actually create more collaboration between states? Are we seeing that states are actually wanting to, to work together a bit more? Has anybody got any examples or any ideas that they would um, uh, that, that, that they, they think about from this side? Um, maybe you, Romuald, if you've got any comments on that. Okay, well... Uh... Talking about uh, the issue, what we have noticed is that during this week, we already have uh, two airlines, uh, Cabo Verde Airlines and uh, uh, South Africa Express, which has completely uh, closed the operations because of that uh, low demand. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, I'm afraid that we don't have a specific method to assess uh, how heavy will be that impact on the African carrier since we don't know uh, the duration of this, uh, of this crisis. But uh, as well, uh, for the recovery, it's true that Africa market, uh, looking on this perspective, according to what the ITA said, Afri the impact on aviation market in Africa will be lower comparing to the other regions worldwide. But in terms of uh, recovery, there are some airlines which will be more affected uh, compared to other ones, like domestic uh, carriers operating on the local market, the impact on their finances will be, uh, quite, will be quite different comparing to those African airliners uh, covering the international, uh, to the international uh, uh, network. But according to me, mm, we really need, those airliners really need government support, if not many of them may lead to bankruptcy if nothing is done uh, because the crisis is very serious in terms of, because very, uh, very soon they will be having this shortage of liquidities. So they need government support uh, to, yeah, to keep on foot and uh, to continue to operate. Uh, if I refer to what the ITA said, ITA said uh, two weeks back that Africa market will have a loss of uh, $400 million. But, uh, but regarding the new restriction which has been imposed by uh, government, we see that those figures today, they are out, uh, out of date. So the impact will be, will be enormous. And we, airline, African airlines, really need uh, government support to tackle uh, this issue. And uh, otherwise, on the other way, I do believe that even to tackle this issue, we need this uh, collaboration within the old stakeholder at the level of AFRA, at the level of Civil Aviation uh, Commission, at the level of African Union, uh, to work together in order to tackle uh, this issue. I can come back with some uh, concrete solutions we may propose. So, so the question there is, which is actually coming in from, um, uh, from, from, from John, who, who's uh, our ambassador here at Aviadev, but he's asking, have you heard anything from AFRA or ACI Africa or the African Union or AFCAC you know, is anything actually being done? Are they convening some sort of uh, emergency get together? Are they doing anything in terms of creating this collaborative approach or have we not heard anything yet? Are we, we expecting that soon? Romuald, have you heard anything? Oh, Kojo. Okay, okay. Uh, what I heard, what I heard, uh, I really appreciate uh, what the Secretary General of Afra, uh, Abdirahman Bertet, uh, did uh, some weeks back by by uh, raising awareness of government about this issue, he has been, uh, he has been interviewing on some uh, medias in Kenya, in uh, Congo, where he tried to, he tried to raise attention about, about uh, this crisis. And he said that actually we cannot even evaluate the impact, but what we need to do in these present circumstances is this collaboration between uh, all the stakeholders uh, to, tackle the, to tackle these issues. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, just uh, I'll come to you now, Kojo, but uh, there's been a couple of really interesting comments here. So um, uh, Dave, uh, uh, Dave over in Ireland has said, um, you know, unfortunately, right or wrong, this this uh, crisis will weed out airlines that, that, that potentially are, are weak. Um, but then to counter that from Clive, who's down there in Lusaka, he said, you know, what what concerns him is that government owned airlines uh, will will survive potentially because they're not necessarily operated in the same way, and what that means is any of this any of this growth and any of this challenge from the private sector where we're trying to get commercially viable airlines if they don't um, uh, don't survive then of course we'll be back to the position where you'll have monopolies on routes you and of course the price will go up and the passengers again this whole concept that uh, Africa World Airlines, FastJet are trying to say, look, you know, people can fly, everybody can fly, we'll bring the price down. If they're not around, then of course, we'll go back to the to the bad old days, I suppose. So Kojo, if you can take this, and then Lizzie after that, because I know you're close with the AWA guys there in Ghana as well. No, I mean, John, I mean, the, the point I was coming to was the fact that we've not actually, uh, we've not had any official announcement by African Union since the thing started, okay? And uh, as opposed to the European Union, European Commission and all of that, we, we've seen, you know, people moving. And, and if African Union couldn't come out with anything to say, for example, even how to deal with the crisis, then it, it means that we would have, uh, you know, um, uh, different approaches. And to also understand, and you know better that, that you know, airline is a very, you know, uh, it, it's highly capital intensive business. And you know, most of our airlines in Africa are suffering. So if you see the African government banning uh, or putting in restrictions, whatnot, there hasn't been any stimulus packages announced. Like Tony was saying, there are something that they're going to, people are lobbying the government. But once you put in these things, the airlines are going to even, you know, uh, uh, you know enter administration because most of them don't have it. Now in Kenya, from the tourism point of view, uh, the head of state had announced yesterday that uh, tourism businesses have to see the banks and they've, they've engaged the financial institutions. Now, what they were doing was to say that, okay, we want you guys to review your, 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 your rates and all of that and, and you know, all the loans. It's a progressive measure. But at what point in time can we say that uh, people can see it throughout this season, that government can make these uh, decisions in... Uh, at this point, but who actually see that these things are implemented? Because after these things are done, hotels, airlines, all ancillary businesses will go suffering. And remember, our airlines are already in the line already, in the red line already, I mean, the African airlines. So in terms of major decisions, because we saw the uh, European Union saying that slot fees are being waived off, I think, up until June or something, June or July. We've not had something strong classic from our, our government. So my concern is that there ought to be something that people will be able, because if hotels are losing, and then we are saying that because of health, public health issues, which is true, what kind of measures can we put in place to say that we will, we will use this amount of money to cushion this uh, industry operator? So we, we may have to think about this. It's, it's, all, it's, a, it's a gray area that I've not been answered very clearly. That's, that, that's my viewpoint. Yeah, perfect. And um, Lizzie, just to add from your side. Okay, uh, John, kindly repeat the question again. Yeah, sure. So we, we, we were talking about um, the impact that this could potentially have on the private airlines. And obviously, you know, there in Ghana, you've got a, an airline that's a bit of a flag bearer for private airlines that do well in, um, in, in a tough market in Africa World Airlines. Uh, and we're, we're actually going to be joined by, by the, uh, the team there next week and, and our next webinar, which will be quite interesting to, to get this from them. But what's happening on the ground with them? Are they redeploying capacity into the domestic market? Are they, are they parking planes? How, would, how are they getting through this process? Okay. Um, from what I know, some of the flights have been cancelled and then um, some staff have been told to work from home. Yeah, so um, I think it's, it's affecting everyone, really. Because if um, you're canceling flights, if you're suspending some of your schedules, 
a time may come where you would maybe say you don't need the stuff anymore. And that is what we are hoping it doesn't get to. So, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I totally, totally agree. And as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully have the opportunity to speak with the team there on the webinar next week. So we'll give you some more information on that. Now, we're going to wrap up for today because we're 10 minutes over. So thank you, everybody out there, all the participants. I see there's still loads of people on the line. So thank you very much. Um, any feedback that you have about this, feel free to, to reach out to me directly. Um, John.Howell at aviationdevelop.com. Um, all of the panelists' social media links, I'll send those over to all of the attendees so you can get in touch with the, uh, the brains behind the operation here and, um, and, and obviously follow their publications, their blogs, uh, and you can do a lot worse than interacting with all of them uh, across Africa. Um, I think we got a nice view, an overview, obviously thanks to Phil and thanks to Becca for providing those overviews on just, we know it's bad and it's how bad it is, but what I said at the beginning, I, I want to say again, which is um, I think it's really important at this time when we're isolated that we come together as a community, we share some ideas. So we'll be putting this, um, we'll be putting this recording out onto YouTube, we'll put it out onto Facebook, etc. So please feel free to share that with anybody you think will we'll find it of interest. Um, and the final thing before we go is just to take the poll again, just to see whether you guys out there feel more or less um, uh, optimistic. So this is poll two. It's the same question. Do you feel more or less optimistic in terms of the, the future and how long it's going to take to recover? Um, it seems from the answers I can see here, and we'll share that with you. Uh, it's it shifted a little bit to the pessimistic side, so well done, guys. <laughs> um, and the final the final comment the final comment from uh, from my side is just to say that um, and there was a great comment on the Q and A, which is maybe this is the perfect time to get states together to implement SATAM. You know, if it can't get any worse, maybe now's the time to just say, okay, let's let's open open up as much as possible, or for those who are ready, let's open up. Because uh, obviously we've all been frustrated by the progress or lack of it on the single African air transport market. And I'll, I'll be trying to get AFCAC and AFRA and IATA and ACI. I'll, I'll try and get them on a future webinar so you can put their, your questions to them as well. And we can progress this conversation because we all want the same thing, which is a, obviously a thriving African aviation industry. Um, so, yes, the uh, final, final thing to say is the recording will be on YouTube. We've retaken the poll. And uh, this is next week's webinar for you just to save the date. I'll send an invitation round and you can register. Uh, but I'll be delighted next week to have um, Lam Mozambique, Asky, Africa World Airlines, and Agaga from down there in South Africa as well um, to join me. And we'll talk about the impact on the, the airline side and their response to it. Uh, any ideas for other panelists, anybody who wants to join us on a future webinar? please do. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks to all my panelists, all the participants. We'll come back to all your questions. We'll check them all through. It's quite hard for me to chair this and answer the questions and sort out the technology. So thank you for bearing with us. And um, we will see you for the next webinar next week. So